We will be talking about uh, developing countries like Nepal and Rwanda with Mr. Sunar Verma. So you recently took part in Kigali Global Dialogue, which was a few days ago. Uh, so could you share your personal experience and impressions of participating in Kigali Global Dialogue in Rwanda as a speaker? Thank you very much. So the Kigali Dialogue Forum is a very unique forum because it is a dialogue which encourages developing countries or what is now known as the Global South to come together and discuss issues that are critical. So it is a very important dialogue forum, I would say, one because of who convenes it. So it's convened by the Observer Research Foundation of India and the Rwanda Governance Board. So these are two organizations that have very high credibility in the arena of international policy discussions. So that is number one on who convenes it. They have credibility. Number two, it is a forum that is very carefully curated. So it is curated in a way that it brings diverse voices, diverse views, diverse opinions at the platform to be debated. So an example of uh, this conscious curation is that this is one forum where you have a very strong representation of at least 50% women as speakers, which makes it unique. The next is it is set in Kigali, Rwanda. Rwanda is the fastest growing economy uh, among the fastest growing economies of Africa. So it is an environment which is inspiring for those of us who come from developing countries to see how a nation is being built. Uh, so that is what is attractive about this forum. And the questions that this forum asks are very brave. So they don't shy away from discussing problematic issues. And of course, what I find really attractive is that the behavior of participants at the Kigali Dialogue Forum is very different from when these forums are, head, are held in the first world. Because participants are able to express their views without trying to adjust to potential donors or potential sources of funding. So they behave naturally. They express their concerns naturally. These are not concerns that are adjusted to what a donor may want to hear or what we may think that a donor wants to hear. So it's a very frank exchange. And these are the kind of exchanges that our part of the world or developing countries we really need, where we can express what the critical issues are, debate them, learn from each other's experiences. And that is what the Kigali Global Dialogue really represents in the world policy arena. Um, can you share some insights that you gained by participating in the dialogue? So I think there are many insights that I gained. Uh, number one, by virtue of this event taking place in Kigali in Rwanda, that when you arrive in Kigali, the atmosphere that you see, how the country is growing, how civic sense is very strongly present, how women are strongly represented throughout the country, not just in so-called soft positions of health and education, but you see women heading organizations that deal with finance, that deal with security, that deal with industry. So that is the first impression you get. The other insights that I gained is that the dialogue between developing countries is critical. Because very often what happens is that the developed countries have become the facilitator of poor countries talking to each other. So there's, there's a lot that we learn because our experiences are similar. We come from a position of uh, resource constraints. We come from a different setting. Most of our countries have a colonial past. Uh, so our concerns are not necessarily understood by everyone the way we feel them. So this kind of dialogue is critical. It is critical that developing countries, we exchange thoughts with each other and that we create regional alliances. We create issue-based alliances because the old structure of alliances does not hold any relevance in today's world order. Today's world order requires new alignment. It requires issue-based alliances. It requires cross-border collaborations. It requires 
collaboration between those who have similar issues and challenges. So we need to talk among ourselves and then we can talk to others. So these are the, I would say, the main insights I've gained. So the dialogue was held in Rwanda and um, it's Kigali Global Dialogue. So such uh, dialogue has helped the country to garner international attention. So can you elaborate on how these dialogues have effectively promoted Rwanda's achievements and helped in fostering global engagement? So as I mentioned, the Kigali Global Dialogue uh, brings a very wide group of quite influential uh, people together around one platform. Uh, this year's Kigali Global Dialogue 2023 by the ORF Foundation brought people from 70 countries. And they brought them together in a, what I would call an intimate setting of around 250 participants over three days, which allows for exchange to happen. So number one is those who come to Kigali. First, they understand what is happening in Kigali in Rwanda as a country. For example, for me, it was an eye opener that over the last 20 years, Rwanda has doubled its life expectancy. Now that is evidence. That is not something in the air but it is hardcore evidence, you have the data there. Then you see the kind of inroads uh, Rwanda has made into promoting its tourism. From the moment you board the flight of Rwanda Air and you land at Kigali Airport, you reach your hotel, you are surrounded by very discreet but effective messaging on tourism. So these are some of the things that happen when you host a dialogue in Kigali. One is influential participants get to see what your country is doing. Second, they begin to see what are the partnership opportunities to learn from each other, to exchange ideas. So that is a massive gain for a country in terms of goodwill. And you see that in Nepal also, that uh, people who came to Nepal as young tourists when they were, let's say, 17, 18, 19, 20, they come back to this country as ambassadors, they come back to Nepal as high officials from different governments. So the goodwill that they gained at the age of 17 to 20 still exists in their hearts. And that is what happens when policymakers come to a place like Rwanda and see good governance in action. And they carry it back as a message to their policy circles. I think that is a very effective uh, goodwill campaign that a country like Rwanda does by hosting such important dialogues as the Kigali Global Dialogue. Uh, Rwanda has made some significant improvement in development despite the genocide that occurred not long ago. So what are the factors or strategies? What do you believe contributed to Rwanda's transformation into like current uh, Africa's fastest developing nation? So transformation is the word that describes Rwanda. Number one is visionary leadership. So Rwanda's president, Paul Kagame, has articulated a very clear vision for his country and where he would like to see the country. So there is a long-term vision which has been very clearly articulated along with a roadmap on how they want to achieve it. So it's not just talking in the air, but it is a concrete vision with concrete plans on how to walk down that road. That's number one. Number two is good governance which means an intent and an action to control corruption and increase transparency in any public dealing. And that comes across very strongly in Rwanda, how the government of Rwanda is using technology to counter any kind of non-transparent action or corruption. Number third is investing in human resources. So Rwanda is heavily investing into quality education and healthcare for all its citizens. Universal health coverage is something that is high on the agenda of Rwanda. They have modified the curriculum in schools. They have created one national identity. The next is a very strong focus on gender equity. So focus on the girl, child and women, making sure that they have a voice at the top decision-making table. So these are some of the critical things that Rwanda has done, which are absolutely, absolutely admirable 
and very visible. And within the last 20 years, it is for anyone to see how this country has come out of a position of post-conflict, a lot of trauma, to a country that is looking forward, forging ahead, looking into the future with a single mind and with very clearly defined targets. And that I find absolutely fascinating. So, like you said, the transition from society torn by violence and ethnicity, and now it is embracing its unity. So that transition is indeed remarkable for like a landlocked country or a small country like Rwanda. So what do you believe were key factors that facilitated this transition? And how can other countries with similar situations, similar socioeconomic problems can learn from Rwanda's experience? Transitions are difficult, and especially when they come with so much trauma in a small country where the numbers are so high of people who, who died, who were killed in the genocide. But I think this is where leadership once again comes in. A leadership that understands the value of reconciliation and dialogue. So Rwanda has had, held a very systematic process of dialogue and reconciliation in the country. They've held, operated a system of local courts and local bodies to look into reconciliation through dialogue. So that has helped them address the wounds and allowed it to begin healing. That's number one. Countries with such traumas need to have the ability to talk and reconcile. We have seen that in South Africa. We have seen it in Rwanda. So a very systematic and serious approach to reconciliation is critical. The second is integrating these very complex and difficult to address issues in school curriculums. That the children understand the past, that they're able to address this and move forward. Third is once again to the issue of gender. How do you ensure that women are strongly represented in every decision-making body? In most of the other developing countries, women are almost absent from the decision-making table. You just need to look at tweets from governments of developing countries and gov the government of Rwanda. The government of Rwanda's tweets, the photos you will see, have a very strong representation of women. And you would see a similar thing in countries like Singapore, or uh, you would see it in Hong Kong, for example. Right? So these are some of the things they have targetedly focused on. And then, of course, they have had a very clear vision on how to address poverty. They recognize that uh, all these other are aspirational goals, but if people don't have basic things addressed, such as employment, education, health, these are the lowest requirements in the Maslow's table, right? So if people are hungry, uneducated, illiterate, you cannot build a nation. And Rwanda has understood it. They have committed to it. And one can see that these are things that form each and every decision of theirs as a policy. So that is what I think has helped them get past this very traumatic uh, history that they have had. So Rwanda has focused a lot in agricultural development to progress since the genocide. Nepal is also an agro-based country. So what methods used by people of Rwanda can be applicable for Nepal to develop agriculturally? So you see, I don't think Rwanda and what it is achieving should be treated in segments. Or what is Rwanda doing in agriculture? Or what is Rwanda doing well in health? Or what is Rwanda doing well in education? One has to look at it in totality. Because what I think Rwanda is doing is it is addressing the core problems that plague a low-income country. Good governance is not only related to good governance, health, education, but it cuts across sectors. So it seeps into agriculture as well. The use of technology is something Rwanda is embracing modern new technology that is evidence-based, that is data-based, is being used in, in Rwanda. One can see it in the 
new projects or innovation around irrigation. Or you can see it on how they are creating mechanisms for products to reach from the farm to the market. So that is investment in infrastructure. But a very concerted effort realizing that from the farm to the market is a critical issue for the farmer. Number three, Rwanda is investing in a big way in supporting cooperatives where small farmers, they come together and they have access to common resources. So these are very common sense thinking and actions, but common sense works only in environments where there's good governance and corruption doesn't seep in. So the criticality around Rwanda's achievements needs to be seen in a bigger context of good governance, gender equity, investing in human resources, and bringing technology as a partner, not as a threat or as an adversary. And Rwanda shows that the country of Thousand Hills can achieve this within 20 years of coming out of a genocide. Then for other countries, it is only a matter of do they have the intention to do it or not? So uh, for a country like Nepal, which is quite similar to Rwanda, as it has faced many transitions in political system of the country, uh, it is now a democratic country experiencing several changes in political system. So in your view, what aspects should of Rwanda's governance, leadership or policies can benefit countries like Nepal facing similar political changes? So in Rwanda, what uh, strikes as, uh, as remarkable is, number one, is the political vision, the leadership that has a long-term vision for the country. Uh, I think that is a challenge in a number of low-income countries because you have such frequent changes of government. So Rwanda has the advantage that way, if you wish, of uh, giving a massive mandate to their president over the last 20 years to determine the course of where Rwanda goes. So that allows for a lot of streamlined decision making and continuously moving forward. But that is a mandate that people give. So that is not much one can do about it. Uh, but that has helped Rwanda in my view that there has been this very strong mandate over two decades that has allowed a systematic approach. That's number one. Number two is the government of Rwanda has shown what I would say is political stewardship. That means that Rwanda has determined its course of development. In practical terms, it means that the international support, aid, technical assistance that comes to Rwanda comes through the government. It does not go directly to any other actors, civil society, think tanks, etc., so that channeling of resources allows for the government to determine how to move forward and what support coming from outside can feed into the national processes. And the third thing, once again, is that the political leadership of Rwanda, the government of Rwanda, feels comfortable and not threatened by women as a gender. And because of that, you see women in so many decision-making roles. In most other countries of the developing world, women are invisible, absent, or actually excluded from decision-making at the high table. When you exclude women from decision-making from the high table, what happens is you are excluding the thinking of 50% or more than 50% of your population, which essentially means that half your decisions are going to be wrong. So it's a very expensive process to exclude women in terms of national development. And Rwanda has figured this out. Singapore has figured this out. So many of the developed countries have figured this out. But the global south, we are still struggling um, with this issue. And I think the men in low-income countries, the way we are bringing up boys, there's something wrong in that because we are not able to create men who are confident enough to be equal partners with women on the high-level decision-making. So Rwanda has managed to achieve socio-economic and political development simultaneously, which is still a challenge for many developing countries and least developed countries. In your opinion, 
what factors do you think contributed to Rwanda's success in achieving dual development? And what lessons can other countries draw from Rwanda's experience in balancing socio-economic and political development? So I think the lessons from Rwanda are many and they are very difficult to implement. One, because they do depend on political leadership. They do depend on leadership. Number one, having a vision. Number two, being able to articulate that vision. Number three, to be able to follow up on that vision through concrete, transparent initiatives that the public can see and the public can quickly benefit from. That's number one. Number two lesson is invest in human resources, which essentially boils down to provide quality education in your public schools, provide quality health through your public health system, guarantee universal health coverage. Number three, gender equity. Male politicians should not be afraid of having an equal number of women or more at the decision-making table. There's ev enough evidence the world over to show that the moment you bring women on the senior high-level decision-making table, those decisions are better. They're economical and they save time. They're more efficient. So these three lessons are critical. They're very obvious because one can see them in Rwanda. It is not on a report or talk. You see it at the Kigali Dialogue Forum when you look at the speakers that were from Rwanda, whether it is the health minister of Rwanda, whether it was the governor, uh, the sorry, the CEO of Rwanda Governance Board, whether it was other top leadership who spoke that these were all women. And these were women who were not on these positions that are ceremonial or for decoration purposes. These are, view, uh, these are women who are running strong organizations, who have professional views and who don't hesitate to articulate their views. So these, I would say, are the lessons. Uh, so, as you said before, Rwanda has been able to garner a lot of tourist attract, uh, attention. So, Nepal is also a little bit um, inclined towards tourism development. It is uh, trying to develop more tourism in the country. It has more tourist attraction than Rwanda in comparison, but still it is not as successful as Rwanda. So what could be the cause behind it and what steps can Rwanda take and what lessons and what uh, methods that Rwanda has applied can be applicable in Nepal in developing the tourism sector? So tourism as a sector does not exist on its own in some other universe. It is not isolated. So imagining tourism to be flourishing when the rest of the country is not, I think is unrealistic. For tourism to flourish in a country, the issues that give Rwanda an advantage, such as good governance, such as security, such as lack of corruption, they reflect very strongly on tourism. The moment to a tourist arrives in a country, the first impressions the tourist gets are very different in a country where there's no corruption and a country where there is corruption because you begin encountering the negative outcomes of corruption at every step. Be it from the luggage trolley you take or don't find, to the toilets you use at an airport, to the information desk being manned by someone who is competent and knowledgeable compared to someone who has been appointed because they are a friend or relative of someone. So for tourism to prosper in any country, good governance is critical in the country. Number two is in terms of branding. Rwanda has managed to very successfully and smartly brand the gorilla as a landmark attraction which is not available in too many parts of the world and selling of that experience packaged together with other cultural experiences has been very successful for them. The other thing is uh, the infrastructure. The infrastructure that the Rwandan government has created to support tourism has been remarkable. 
And last but not the least, um, I think in, in developing countries where they want to promote tourism, you have to see the private sector as a partner industry and not just as a tax paying or tax generating industry. So an environment has to be created for the private sector that is truly enabling. But that again links to good governance, that again links to anti-corruption. So a strong focus on quality, a strong focus on safety. So the question that many developing countries need to ask themselves is, are they interested in attracting high net worth tourists or are they interested only in attracting backpackers because the economies of these two are very different and the approach to them is very different but once again i would repeat for tourism to be robust and quality key issue is good governance safety uh, gender equity um, so finally uh, based on your experience and analysis as a global researcher, what methods do you believe should be considered by Nepal to develop in a globally appealing way? I think Nepal is a God-gifted country when it comes to nature, when it comes to beautiful places, when it comes to extremely warm and welcoming people, when it comes to the prevalence of English language at tourist centers, when it comes to the exposure of Nepal's, tourists, uh, Nepal's residents or people to foreigners. So the exposure that Nepali people have to tourists has been for many, many years, decades. And the, the most important thing is Nepal has a lot of goodwill internationally. So when you mention Nepal to anyone abroad in the Western world, you don't have people divide into those who like Nepal or those who don't like Nepal. There's hardly anyone you meet who does not like Nepal. So that goodwill uh, needs to be utilized. The expertise within the country is there. Nepal does not need international support or international capacity building in my view because the experts are there in Nepal. Uh, so many people from Nepal are working abroad as experts and so many experts are available in Nepal. The key issue is how to make sure that a long-term vision gets implemented systematically. That is one. Second that I see as a serious problem uh, is that women are absent from the decision-making table or women are excluded from the high decision-making table. And that, in, that is critical for any kind of development to happen. And the third issue that I would highlight is human resources, which boils down to high quality education in the public sector, high quality of health in the public sector. So not only in Nepal, but I think in the global south or in the low income countries, a critical debate that needs to happen in our society, but we have been pushing it, avoiding it, is what remains in the public sector and what is in the private sector. There is this view sometimes that has been pushed that privatization is the solution to every problem of quality in the public sector. That is a discussion we need to have. What do we keep in the public sector so that more children can get access to quality education, can get access to health? And we should look carefully at those countries who tell us that we should privatize everything. We should look at their own countries. In their own countries, they are keeping a number of things in the public sector, which is non-negotiable, education, health, etc. But in our countries, the very same actors are trying to convince us that we need to sell public sector education, public sector health. So that is one discussion that is critical, it is urgent, but is not happening as much as I would like to see. Lastly, uh, what do you think, like what methods or, or formulas uh, Rwanda used for being this successful within two decades? And how would you ex uh, compare their political system, their development with Nepal's development? So... Um, 
I have worked in a number of uh, low-income countries, middle-income countries, also high-income countries. And that has given me a chance to compare. I've also worked in emergency scenarios, post-humanitarian disaster countries. I've worked in landlocked countries. And there are a number of features that come to mind when I look at Rwanda's uh, success story. So I myself am a student of science. And for me, evidence is critical in decision making. And I think politicians have a choice to make. You cannot be selective in choosing when you want to take evidence for decision making and when you want to avoid evidence in decision making. Rwanda, in my view, has used evidence to take decisions. It has seen what are the things that need to be changed for people to be able to access health. No, it is not rocket science. The world has so many examples of success stories. You just need to have the intention to believe in ev the evidence and the intention to implement. So number one is we need to have more politicians who believe in evidence. And we need to have political advisors who tell their political masters that the evidence needs to be followed for good decision making. That is, I would say, number one. Number two is... How do we create a political professional? In many developing countries, becoming a politician is a random act. In countries like Rwanda, you see a systematic approach to building politicians. So there's a mechanism of training. There's a mechanism of building future leaders. And you can see that they have succession planning. So each person who is in power in Rwanda, they create succession plans. And that allows them to build their political cadres. The third is once again that in building a political class, in building politicians, they don't shy away from making sure that girls and women are an equal partner in that political development. The fourth thing that I have noticed in Rwanda is the ability of politicians and leaders to communicate complex ideas in a simple and understandable way to the population. Because when you're making change, you need to build a partnership with the public where you're constantly telling them of the change that is going to happen and not inform them after the change has been made. Nobody likes to be informed of change after a change has been made. Because then you are dumping change on people. Governance requires that you partner with the people. And through an ongoing dialogue, you engage them in change. Then they become your partners. Last but not the least, I would say, is that the politicians of Rwanda, it seems to me, have been crystal clear on the objectives of development aid and humanitarian aid. They have maintained control, they have maintained stewardship on Rwanda's national development agenda. And based on that, they have partnered with those who subscribe to that vision for Rwanda. They have not allowed development partners, development agencies to write their national development agenda. So investing in, in the bureaucracy of Rwanda has been very important for them. So Rwandan bureaucrats and technocrats are able to have a strong discussion, debate with any international actor. And because there's a long-term vision of Rwanda, the technocrats and bureaucrats feel safe and secure enough to pursue that agenda because they don't feel that they would be transferred or removed from their position based on what they are doing, because they're all following a declared, publicly available, national nation-building agenda. So these are the things uh, that um, I have found to be very impressive in how Rwanda has not just shown political will, has not just shown political intention, but every day is moving forward in systematically and transparently 
implementing the National Development Plan. So what, what is striking in Rwanda uh, or in Kigali? So, so what is striking uh, from my experience at the global, Kigali Global Dialogues is that the people of Rwanda at any level who I met, be it the bellboy at the hotel, be it the general manager at a hotel property, be it the uh, person who checked me in at Rwanda Air Counter in Kigali, there's immense sense of pride in the citizens of Rwanda in being Rwandans. There's a very strong sense of a common national identity. There's a very strong sense in, of optimism in the future of the country. So when you have these elements which are visible in every citizen, which is often reflected in the fact that in Kigali, everyone I spoke to, everyone looks you in the eye throughout your conversation. So that speaks of a lot of confidence and pride in what you represent. So that national pride is a very strong driver, which is often missing in a lot of our developing countries, where you feel that every second person actually is busy with an exit plan from the country. So many of the developing countries never actually build a critical mass of people who actually believe in the future of their own country. So when that critical mass is not there, change cannot happen. This is not what I saw in Rwanda. I saw a proud people, a determined people, and an optimistic people. And I think that is a critical ingredient for any of our countries to move forward. Thank you for your time and your insights on these topics. Thank you very much, Sakriya. It has been a pleasure speaking to you. Same here. And thank you for your insightful questions.